Hi everyone. Wanted to do a review with a bit of a difference today. Um, this is a model, stroke toy model, of a medieval trebuchet. Um, I've, I've developed an interest in medieval siege weapons recently for um, reasons that will probably become apparent to you in the near future um, with an upcoming video. Um, and it occurred to me I would like to make a, a working model of a trebuchet um, because they, they are beginning to sort of interest and fascinate me. And um, I was searching around on the internet and uh, there are quite a lot of kits around. Um, they tend to be uh, aimed at the sort of school project age group. This one um, is suitable for age nine upwards. There we go. Um, so I'm hoping I'll be able to cope with the, uh, the modelling aspects of it because I'm not a terribly good modeller. Um, I, f I found it. There are quite a few around, as I say. Um, a lot of them, though, have drawbacks in one way or the other, as far as I can see from reviews. Um, in particular, um, a lot of them have a kind of spoon-shaped uh, device on the end of the throwing arm here, rather than this sling. And an authentic trebuchet of, of, of this type would actually have a sling, and the projectile would be placed in the sling, rather than in a cup. Um, so this one, this one caught my eye in particular, and I thought I'd give it a go. But I found it on a website, again, um, that I was unaware of, which is the Historic Royal Palaces um, website. Now, I didn't even know there was such a, an enterprise as the Historic Royal Palaces. I um, don't know how long they've been around. Um, they're a little bit um, in the kind of mode of other organisations such as English Heritage, but they they deal with the management of um, six uh, palaces. Um, I've got a list of them here. Hampton Court, uh, the Tower of London, Banqueting House, which is in Whitehall, Kensington Palace, Kew Palace, and Hillsborough Castle, which is in Northern Ireland. Um, so I, whether they've only just um, set up this body or not, I don't know. It's the first time I've ever heard of them. But they have got a really, they must have uh, gift shops in all these places, and they have got a really good um, uh, website, an online store, with some quite interesting gifts, um, a little bit out of the ordinary, all with uh, historical or royal related themes. And I think the reason they sell this is because um, uh, the there was a very famous... Um, siege machine that belonged to or was um, fielded by Edward I when he besieged Stirling Castle in 1304, known as the War Wolf. So I think they've kind of formed a link between uh, previous monarchs and siege machines. I don't know. Anyway, um, this struck me as being an interesting one to try out. And uh, so I'm going to spend some time, I haven't even taken a look inside it yet, it's only just arrived. Uh, it comes in all sort of pre-cut pieces. Um, all you need is to add a bit of PVA glue. Um, there's all dowel pins and so on to uh, hold it all together. So I'm hoping it says you can put it together in two hours. Um, the only thing I think I suspect, um, and looking at it, I'm pretty sure I'm correct. That's missing. It would be. The appropriate weights to put in the in the in the tray in the bucket there. So I was thinking I might have to get something like lead shot or something to put in it, and then um, I'll put it together and um, give it a go, give it a try out, and uh, talk to you a little bit more about uh, trebuchets in general. Um, but I I think it's a really interesting. Uh, I mean, it had, I, had, I, had I had one of these when I was age nine or above, I, I can well remember having lots of uh, model knights, plastic toy soldiers and so on, that this would have been fantastic for. 
I had a, a toy castle. Um, this this would actually be great for throwing projectiles at that castle, knocking the soldiers over, and, and, and all kinds of things. But as I say, it has got an educational um, uh, value to it as well. So I think it's a great uh, a great um, gift to give to your kids if you've got kids of the, the appropriate age. Um, but at the same time, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna enjoy doing it myself. Um, anyway, so I'll put it together and come back to you when uh, when it's constructed. Okay, so this is the completed model. Um, it actually took me quite a few hours to put together. Um, I would say that this would challenge a nine-year-old uh, for a number of reasons, and also I I took my time with it because I think it's quite important to allow the PVA time to dry, allow the glue time to dry before you uh, press on with the next, each step. Um, so it takes a lot longer than a few hours to, to put together I would say and it would certainly need a certain amount of adult su supervision for a nine year old. Um, for instance, uh, there's quite a lot of doweling and some of the doweling, uh, such as this length here, and the length of doweling that goes across there, are um, pre-cut and of the correct lengths. But most of the doweling that holds the, the joints together, such as there and there, uh, there, there and so on, um, it's just one long piece of doweling that you have to cut to the the correct lengths and that can vary between um, one centimetre long and a couple of centimetres long. Um, you get a surplus amount, I mean here's the amount of doweling that I've got left over, um, but what they suggest you do is scour it or score it with a um, a pair of scissors and then just snap it off and I wasn't happy to do that really because I thought um, it could easily snap and splinter when you're doing that um, and being a sort of curved surface um, to make any kind of impression with a pair of scissors does involve a certain amount of force so accidents might happen um, so I um, I used a hacksaw in the end. I measured off the lengths with pencil and uh, used a hacksaw. And they give you a you come, the pack comes with a tiny little bit of sandpaper, so you can uh, rub down any rough edges like like that. Um, oh, and also it does come. I think I said you needed to supply your own glue, but it does come with a little pot of uh, white glue um, that you can use. So that I mean that that scoring the doweling is probably the least of your um, worries in terms of children child being able to do it but um, there are some other considerations as well I mean I did find the dowling to be a very tight fit in places it took a lot of effort to get the dowling to go through some of the holes but I didn't want to drill the holes out any uh, further in case that then uh, made things too loose um, I mean there were certain places where you have to glue the doweling in and other places such as here um, where you want the doweling to be uh, loose so that things can swing about. <coughs> um, I had a few issues as well in particular um, with this box the weight because you, this is one of the first things you put together and um, there are, there's a bottom part and there are four sides to it, and um, there's a dowling, a da piece of dowling that goes right through from one side to the other, which um, houses this other kind of pivot mechanism here. Now, um, when you glue this part to the base and the corresponding opposite part to the base, um, you have to do so so that you get a flat join but also the two pieces have to correspond um, on one side and the other so that the 
doweling pin can go through and meet the hole on the other side. So you have to put the doweling pin in together, um, then glue it, those two pieces down onto the base so that you can be sure you've got a, um, a snug, sort of airtight seal here. Um, but later on in the process, you are then going to have to remove this pin in order to put this assembled part, put, put the downing pin back through the hole, um, back through this assembled part here and out the other side. And these, these parts here in particular were really, really tight. So this is what I mean about having to wait for the glue to dry because you are putting, you're threading this back through, back through these um, apertures here really having to put a lot of pressure on and if that wasn't completely dry you would soon uh, disassemble your previous work um, so i would say a nine-year-old would find that very difficult to do indeed um, similar kind of thing here but not so much of a problem that this all this frame and support and work is assembled first and then you have to fit uh, this long dowling rod here through that through that and then through that but of course that does mean um, that you have to you have to kind of open these these uh, two vertical struts up a little bit in order to do that. Um, it's not easy, and also you have you have you're given a length of kind of clear plastic tubing that you have to cut into sort of half centimeter lengths, um, and these these have to go on as well. So in other words, you have to thread that downing pin through that that this, that, that, and then out the outside of this and then through that as well. Um, so there's a lot of kind of, uh, you need, you need a little, quite a bit of dexterity and you do need to apply a certain amount of force to it. Um, so not a terribly easy construction, um, but this is it in its assembled form anyway. Um, very, I've done this very roughly, and this is going to need, I'll explain why in a minute, but this is going to need a lot more adjustment and work and so on. Um, now, they, they rec what, should, what should I say next? They recommend um, that you fill this box half full with sand, and that is a sufficient weight uh, to throw a projectile. Um, what I'm actually going to do is acquire a lot of lead shot or something like that so i'm going to i think you need a certain amount of patience with this project and i'm going to wait now and try and source some lead shot either from a, a fishing tackle shop maybe or um, diving shops sell lead weight as uh, for ballast for diving equipment um, but i want to get something that's fairly small granules um, that will be maximum kind of uh, efficiency you know so that the weight is uh, the greatest I can get for the volume that I put in there um, and uh, then we'll we'll start to make adjustments um, after that but uh, assembling it is not easy and actually getting it to work I suspect is going to be a lot harder again um, but anyway, it gives you a kind of, uh, it's a very good engineering project for a child, I think, because it gives you a very good idea of the, um, the complexity of the design, just for a simple thing like this. And in fact, um, the, the, the real things would have had to have been far more complicated than this. For one thing, you have to find a method of uh, pulling this arm down. Um, so that it, it locks into position and that would have involved I've got some pictures here um, this is this book is an old um, Funken the, the Lillian and Fred Funken pair who uh, did a lot of the uh, Napoleonic uniforms but this this is one in the original French um, costumes armour and arms from the time of chivalry 
but there's quite a lot of illustrations of siege machines. So this is a very small uh, trebuchet. Um, but I wanted to show you in particular this one here. Um, because some of the larger ones would have involved a lot of pulley systems in order to um, uh, make the whole pulling mechanism a lot more efficient. And they probably would have been operated in a similar way to a lot of the lifts and hoists um, that were used to build some of the great cathedrals, get stone up to the top levels of the cathedrals, that you would have had a, a sort of tread wheel with either one or two men. Uh, working the treadmill in order to pull on the pulley to pull the arm down against this heavy weight here. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say about the design of, of uh, trebuchets though is in this Funken book there are no wheels and there are wheels here and um, what's been realised from um, the reconstruction of replica real, real life size trebuchets um, in recent years is that um, wheels are quite an important aspect of the whole design. Not so that you can move it from one castle or one siege to another or change its position, but um, when this weight is released and the arm the arm raises up and throws the projectile, if it's if it's sort of firm on the ground the whole thing really shakes itself to pieces. Um, whereas if you have wheels, it's, it works as a kind of recoil mechanism um, and takes away a little bit of that, uh, that shock. And um, another interesting thing about the design is that some of the original um, trebuchets didn't have these weights, they, they, the, especially the ones that... Uh, originated in the Orient, they would have lo lots of uh, uh, troops or slaves or whatever pulling on ropes um, and that was known as a perrier and then they realised that they could put a heavy weight here and that would add to the, uh, the thrust um, and then this is the next step where you have a, a, a sort of bucket on a hinge mechanism so that it will drop almost vertically, so you're maximising the amount of, uh, of lift that you give to the projectile. Um, so the adjustments I'm going to have to make is A, the amount of weight that I add to this bucket, and B, the length of string. Um, this is way too long at the moment, um, but the <coughs> I'm going to have to keep adjusting this string until I get it uh, to an appropriate amount. And the shorter the string, the earlier it will release the um, the projectile. Oh, and by the way, they give you a kind of little ball of clay um, that you can... Uh, it's modelling clay that you just roll up and you can use that as a projectile. It goes in the catapult there. Um, I've also, I don't think I have tied these two ends together properly. Um, so I might need to make it a little bit snugger so that it grips the projectile um, a little bit more securely. And, also, and, and having the string at this length, what that means is it will just hang on to the projectile um, way too long and probably throw it backwards or uh, down to the ground about here. So, um, as I say, next step is to get hold of some uh, lead shot or washers or something like that. And then we'll um, start to experiment with making the appropriate adjustments in order for it to throw the uh, clay ball. So, see you again uh, shortly. Okay, well, a couple of months have gone by. Um, the reason being that I changed my mind about what I was going to use to weight the box down. Um, it does say in the instructions that you can fill the box with sand, but I, and that would work fine, but I didn't really want to do that, um, partly because I want to keep the, uh, the toy indoors, and partly because I thought it, it would get a little bit gritty and, and slip through some of the cracks, perhaps, in the, in the wood. So... Um, I was going to buy either something like fishing weights or 
or lead shot. Um, but then I realised that um, it, that's actually quite an expensive way of going about it. Um, it's much cheaper to just simply drop um, the small change from your coinage in it. Um, one pence and two pence pieces are usually uh, made mainly of steel now with a thin layer of copper. Um, and it's actually cheaper to do it that way than to use those coins to purchase um, lead shot, for instance, which has had to be shaped so it can um, wrap around a fishing line or something like that. So it's going to take me quite a while to fill the box entirely with all the change that I get from uh, um, my pocket when I'm out shopping and so on. So I've, I've got a sort of small amount of coins in there at the moment, just to give you an idea of how it works. Um, you can't see at this distance, but um, I've had to play around with the length of the string quite a lot, but at the moment I've just got some very loose knots on it to um, shorten the distance and so on, um, rather than do anything too uh, definite at this stage. And um, it'll probably take me a couple more months at least before I've got enough coins in the box in order to throw the projectile any great distance so um, we're getting into the winter now so I think what I'll do is um, end, end this video um, at this point or at the end of this video at this part and then give you a kind of uh, live firing video update in my garden next spring um, but this will just give you an idea of how it works um, I'm quite pleased with it actually. I think it's it's a really good, uh, really good toy for someone. Um, it's educational. It's got historic interest, um, engineering and modelling kind of interest in it as well. And um, it would suit it would suit a child wanting to hurl projectiles at his toy castle or her toy castle or or someone older who's. Um, doing it for a school project or a history lesson or something like that. So it's got lots of uh, applications and I um, thought I'd get this up well before Christmas in case any of you think of buying it as a suitable present for someone. So anyway, here we go. Um, live firing indoors, so it'll only go, the projectile, you won't see how far it goes, but it'll only go about four or five feet under these conditions. Um, but I've barely got anything in the box, so I can see this hurling projectile quite a long way. Um, but that's for next year. And um, I'll probably replay this in slow motion after if I can manage. But um, watch out for the wheels because it's interesting how the, how the wheels do act as a recoil mechanism. Um, which is the point I was making earlier. So it will rock backwards and forwards on the, on the wheels. And that's transferring the momentum to the projectile rather than into the uh, structure of the machine itself. Okay, here we go. I've got to pull this pin out and it should work. Yeah, brilliant. That hit the um, that hit my wall, but it, if had it gone through the door that's nearby, that probably would have gone about I don't know, probably about ten feet, I reckon. Right. Okay. So um, I'll replay that uh, in slow motion, and that'll be it for this year. And then I'll give you an update again next year in the spring when I've got it outdoors throwing uh, something down the length of my garden. Thanks very much for watching everyone. Bye for now.